Good morning. I have no slides this morning. I'm going to tell stories. And the story that I was asked to tell to talk about fast breeder reactors is the title of this story. And I think it's to be able to understand this story, we have to put it into context. So let's start back in the old days when for lighting we used lamp oil and that lamp oil came from whales. And we had a lot of whaling infrastructure to kill those whales to be able to get the lamp oil. And then in a state in, in the United States called Pennsylvania, they found, it's for you, go ahead and answer that. Then in a state in uh, Pennsylvania, they discovered oil. And they realized that they could make lamp oil from that oil, and so they did that. And the waste product that they had from that lamp oil was gasoline. And that gasoline was dumped onto the ground because it didn't seem that it had value. And then came along the combustion engine, and that engine learned how to use that waste that we called gasoline, and we started having combustion engines that were initially powered by gasoline or octane. There was also another waste product from that, and it was what we call today diesel. And that grade wasn't the same as gasoline, it wouldn't work in a gasoline engine, so then we took that waste product and made a different sort of machine, and that machine that we called a diesel-powered vehicle. So there you see this human evolution of how we made things better by taking a waste product and found some value from that. And today we take uh, crude oils out of the ground, uh, we add some hydrogen to them, and we can take pretty much any organic molecule we want to get it into the form that we want. So how does that have anything to do with fast reactors? So let's pick up the story of how nuclear energy showed up, and I'm picking up the story in 1932 when the neutron was discovered by Chadwick. Then we went to the two German scientists, Hans and Strassmann, in 1939, who then split the atom, but were confused. And what do male scientists do when they're confused? They seek the wise counsel of a female scientist, Lisa Mittner. And Lisa Mittner then explained to them that this atom probably fissioned or broke in half like we do in the biological process. And unfortunately, because she was Jewish and it was during the war and she was in Germany, she never got put on that seminal paper and never received a Nobel Prize. So we didn't do her justice, if you will. Then if we fast forward to 1942, under the leadership of Enrico Fermi, we verified that we could not only split atoms, but they produced enough neutrons that we could get a self-sustaining chain reaction. And from that 1942 critical pile underneath a squash court in Chicago, you know the story, that led to the Manhattan Project, which developed two nuclear weapons that were used to end the war in Japan. Those scientists, some of them, after it was dropped, felt that the United States should have done a demonstration rather than using the weapon to be able to get the Japanese to surrender. And so after the war was over, they wanted to show the peaceful purposes of the atom, just like the American Nuclear Society wants to see the peaceful purposes of the atom used. And their vision was, to do this, we need to make electricity because that would be a great source of energy. However, based on their calculations, based on their assumptions, there was not enough uranium to be able to do that. Similar to India, doesn't have that indigenous uranium on the plan they wanted, therefore the three-step process to get to thorium reactors. And so the very first reactor that was conceived in 1946, 1947, was what we call the breeder reactor. The concept was to use uranium to make plutonium, and then you would have more fuel than what you started with. It seemed impossible. It seemed like it was a continuous motion machine, and nobody believed it. So the scientists from Oak Ridge and Argonne National Laboratory didn't want to build it in their states because it might have been unsafe, so they went to the state that I lived in, in Idaho, because we had enough deserted land, and said, can we put it there? And we wanted the economic development, so we said, sure. So 60 miles outside of town, they built experimental breeder reactor number one. And in December of 1951 is when this reactor was the very first reactor to make electricity, the very first reactor to breathe fuel, the very first reactor to use a metal coolant to get it to work. And that's how it began. So what is sodium fast reactors? What does that mean? A fast reactor is a reactor that takes the neutrons at a very high energy and uses those to break other atoms in half. 
The reactors that we use today are water reactors, and those reactors slow the neutrons down to a very low energy, and they break atoms in half because it's a little bit easier. And that's what the technology that's been used pretty much around the world. There's 425 reactors. So when this technology got started, the idea was that we were going to make this plutonium. And then what happened was we made too many Geiger counters. The price of uranium went too high. And that allowed this, the, uh, the market, if you will, to go out and find a lot of uranium. And so that assumption that they made in 1946, 47, that we were going to run out of uranium was false. There was a lot of uranium in the world. And that allowed the technology of light water reactors to move forward. And now we have 425 reactors. With fast reactors, the development continued. And you could use sodium. You could use lead. You could use gas. And you could use molten salt. So if we look around the world, we can see that there's about 22 different fast reactors around the, the, around the world. India has one that's running right now, the test reactor, and soon the second one, the prototype test reactor that's coming online. And so as a community that I'm in with the fast reactor community, we have learned from each other on how to continue to improve that technology. So when you look at the future, the fast reactor really represents, if you go back to my metaphor, of the diesel-powered car. Okay. So when we dug, dug up and had this oil, and we made gasoline, and that gasoline allowed us to run cars, and the waste from that was the diesels, really the sodium fast reactor represents a diesel-powered car in, a, in that metaphor. So what I mean by that is when we look at which vehicle is better, a gasoline-powered or a diesel-powered, I would say neither are better. They're both needed because we better utilize that resource called oil. And so when we look at which reactor is better, water-cooled or a fast reactor, I would say neither. They're both needed to better utilize that resource called uranium and thorium. And so when we go forward as technologists, we need to realize that's how we use this extra tool. So the way fast reactors were started was because we viewed our world as being finite, our resources limited, and so we headed on that path, and it wasn't true. The Clinch River Breeder Reactor Project in the United States was based on that premise that uranium prices would get so high that we had to make plutonium in a sodium reactor and then give it to the light water reactors to keep them running. And that tr proved to be false. So for my colleagues that are in the fast reactor area, I would submit to you that we need to look at the world differently, that the world has infinite resources if we learn how to use those sustainably. And so with a fast reactor, we can use the waste from our current reactors, and that powers those sodium-cooled reactors or those fast reactors. And so that would be the future I would challenge us as nuclear technologists to realize that we can make this very, very sustainable if we have two tools, the water-cooled and the sodium-cooled, or a fast reactor. You pick the coolant, lead, sodium, salt or gas. I don't want to discriminate. I like sodium, but there are other ones. I've done a lot of research with lead. So I close with this. The sodium-cooled reactor, the one that I'm most familiar with, offers some very unique safety advantages because it's metal fuel and metal cladding with metal coolant that goes in a metal vessel, and you have the ability to reject that decay heat by air circulating right beside the reactor vessel. And that's where the passive reactor safety, if you will, got invented in about 1981. And so the reactor that I work on my day job, that's how it got started. And so in closing, I'd like to say to, to you, the nuclear technologists, that we have two broad sort of technologies, one that runs with a thermal spectrum or water-cooled reactors, and we have another one that operates in a fast spectrum. And neither one of them is better than each other. We need them both so that we can reach the full potential of what nuclear science and technology can do for this world in supplying sustainable energy. Thank you.